Um, we're going to shift gears here and go from the laboratory-based to some very clinical. Uh, and I wish I could show you many, many graphs and all kinds of, of research with the skin disease of juvenile dermatomyositis. But the reality is that we don't have much. Dr. Prockman and I have been talking about this how many decades now? But maybe it's, it, maybe it's time. And, and I will just mention that, that uh, happy to talk about this. We've been doing some very interesting work in other immune-mediated disorders, including non-invasive testing with tape strips and things like that that allow us to do some of the omic type of testing. So maybe, maybe it's time. So you've already seen this before, the, the old Bohan and Peter criteria, and now the, the new ULAR criteria, and I'm not going to go into detail other than to, to uh, remind that the new criteria really do allow more focus on some of the skin manifestations and include them specifically. The cutaneous manifestations, of course, are very important in making the diagnosis, and it's often the dermatologist who uh, is able to say, hey, this is a pattern of dermatomyositis and get that child in for additional testing and ideally early intervention. Because that early intervention, as you've already heard from Dr. Pockman's talk this morning, is very important for limiting to long-term disability, particularly when we're talking about flexion contractures, calcifications, and then these persistent skin changes, which uh, in one study, seven years out, we're present in 40% of patients. So uh, despite uh, intervention that can be successful, the skin lesions remain. So what are the cutaneous features? And I'm going to just spend some time taking a little more time uh, walking you through some of these features. Uh, many of you are very aware of them. And then, of course, we heard some of them this morning. But I think the major feature that I think of when I see these children is telangiectasia, the dilated blood vessel. And it's sometimes hard to distinguish what's active inflammation versus persistent telangiectasia. Uh, we've, we've thought about how we can use some of the newer technology to try to sort this out. And I think one possible way may, may be to start looking at uh, the presence of cytokine expression in the skin, which, which we can do more easily now. So if you look at these pictures, you can see eyelid and malar region telangiectatic erythema. Uh, we think that these dilated vessels and perivascular inflammation represent this immune-mediated vascular injury and small vessel angiopathy. And you can see characteristically, it tends to be more in sun-exposed areas of the face. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, although I think if you look at these patients, you can see it's not always just there. Here's, here's uh, evidence right in a fold area. And in this area here, where we wouldn't expect to have any sun exposure of, of inflammation, so it can extend or you need to think about whether there's a secondary uh, process here, an alternative process like some seborrheic dermatitis. Uh, these telangiectasia are often involving the periorbital area with this uh, edema and a vi violaceous coloration that's the so-called heliotrope rash, which is an important uh, distinguishing feature of uh, dermatomyositis. And you saw this picture before with the eyes blocked. Uh, on the right, because I, I, I love this picture because I think it so beautifully shows that the involvement may be asymmetrical with the, uh, the uh, skin lesions. Uh, and in this case, it's so beautifully paralleled where the swelling and inflammation, the myositis, uh, was, was going on here in this particular boy. I also always wondered, for example, if he spent a lot of time sitting in a, in a car on the right side and had more UV exposure, uh, but I don't know the history. <laughs> um, other sun-exposed areas of involvement, a lot of involvement with this telangiectatic erythema on the face. We heard about the ears before. Always look at the ears. They can be bright red, and as mentioned, can be the only area. Uh, the shoal sign, the V of the neck, and knees and elbows. Now, knees and elbows can be a papular eruption, as shown in these two pictures on the left. Certainly is very often macular or patch-like, um, and sometimes is very subtle. And I've seen several children with very subtle involvement, but with these typical elbow-knee involvement, 
uh, and you don't see too much else, and over time they may get more activity. So always a place to look. And then, of course, the Gatron's papules, when there are actual elevated papules, or the Gatron's sign, when it's just flat telangiectatic erythema. And these tend to be overlying the knuckles. Many examples shown here. And on your right, you can see also that it's not just the hands. It can also be over the joints of the toes. Something that we often don't recognize is this concept of inverse Gatron's papules. These are on the palmar and lateral aspects. Um, and they've been described in a minority of children. But in one study, 75% of those who had these had associated interstitial lung disease. So it may be a sign of that. Uh, and I've shown you many pictures of those here and also even on the toes, as in, in this particular child. Now, mechanics hands is another sign. And I'm not sure, if, if you look at various um, pieces of literature about this, that there's a clear understanding exactly of what this is. But I've always thought of this myself as more hyperkeratotic scaling fissured eruption, especially on the lateral and palmar surfaces of the fingers, that's mistaken for hand dermatitis, but tends to be resistant to the way we usually treat that with topical steroids. And a bi biopsies of these have shown interface dermatitis with mucinosis. Um, and we've also seen, uh, in some patients, such extensive thickening that it looks like a skin disease we call a pityriasis ruba pilaris. But these are some examples of those, uh, as you had much more commonly seen in adults than in children, but we've seen it in several children as well. Uh, the periungual telangiectasia, of course, a cardinal feature, thought to represent uh, early thrombotic phenomena with hemorrhage and dilated capillary loops or bushy capillaries and a vascular areas between. Uh, and very often, what we also see in this area is overgrowth of the cuticle, this cuticular hypertrophy, uh, then associated with these punctate infarcts. And uh, sometimes you can see these very easily uh, without any magnification. I mean, it's very obvious that there's cuticular hypertrophy here, very obvious that you have a vascular areas and then these very bushy loops without even having to magnify, just looking. But um, we also use handheld dermatoscopes or even good old um, ophthalmoscope that's sitting there in, in every office to try to look at this and magnify and see these. And of course, uh, we'll talk a little bit, and you've heard a little bit about uh, assessing the end row loops as well as a way to look at uh, what's happening with the disease. I want to also emphasize the oral mucosae because this is another area where one can see telangiectasia. And sometimes we see telangiectasia just hugging the alveolar ridges there, the gingivae, uh, kind of reminding us of the way they hug the, the nails with the periungual telangiectasia. So capillary microscopy has now become really a, a, a gold standard of providing quantitative information. Um, about what's happening with, with the disease course. And as you saw earlier today, um, we can see anything from normal, and we're looking for it to go back to normal and with response to the severe, as mentioned earlier. And then, of course, skin and mucosal ulcerations. This is one I pulled out of the literature because it was just so dramatic. Uh, but but uh, this is another sign uh, that's not a good sign in patients who are affected. I want to talk a little bit about cutaneous signs of chronicity because, uh, as I mentioned, many children have persistent skin disease over time. And we call this poikilodermatous. So poikilodermatous is the combination of telangiectasia with atrophy of the skin and dispigmentation can be, hyper, can be hypo. Uh, and I think you can see in, in this young lady here um, that the she's had chronic disease and she's left with these chronic signs of skin disease and dermatomyositis, where you can see the, uh, not only the telangiectasia, but the atrophic skin and the, uh, in this case, uh, hyperpigmented areas. Uh, we can also see this over time in uh, the areas uh, overlying the joints. Uh, you can see that the, there's not really any papillarity to it. In fact, if anything, there's atrophy that's remained. You can see residual telangiectasia. 
um, and some hypopigmentation in this case. And these are all signs of disease chronicity. You heard again about lipodystrophy. This can be progressive. It's rare in adults, but it's been seen in, in uh, 8 to 14 percent of children. It's followed the diagnosis of JDM by a mean of about five years. And again, another sign of chronicity, long-standing, untreated disease, more likely to eventuate in, in the lipodystrophy. It's variable in its extent. It can be generalized. It can be partial, especially involving the extremities, or it can be localized. And it's often associated with metabolic abnormalities, especially insulin resistance and hypertriglyceridemia. Um, acanthosis nigricans, of course, is a sign of insulin resistance. That is the velvety, hyperpigmented skin that we see particularly on the back of the neck, but also in other areas like under the arms and the groin layer area in particular, and sometimes uh, even interestingly uh, in areas where we, uh, on the tops of the hands. A hypertrichosis, hepatomegaly and muscle prominence are also features that can be seen in association. Less metabolic change with more local disease. And I don't want to get into calcinosis. We had a beautiful discussion about that and some very exciting new data. Uh, but, but again, to, to stress that this is a long-term con complication, particularly with disease that was not aggressively treated early on in a timely manner. Uh, and this, of, of course, is a long-standing complication that can cause great morbidity and poor functional outcomes. Uh, studies have shown occurring a mean of two and a half years after presentation, um, and these are just a variety of different manifestations of uh, calcinoses in patients, sometimes so extensive that it just totally encases muscles or even looks like an exoskeleton on radiographic evaluation. We think it's due to this chronic low-grade inflammation, tissue damage, of course, Lots more evidence now. I'm fascinated by the uh, mitochondrial effects and want to hear more about that over time. Um, the problem with these is that they're not only so painful, particularly overlying joints or encasing muscles, but they also ulcerate and become a nidus for infection. You saw the picture of this little girl before. That's her buttock. She was the little girl who, at four years of age, passed away. Uh, with septicemia, and um, we know that this was the source of that. Uh, one can also see um, oral, oral ulcerations um, with, with the calcifications. This is uh, a real challenge to manage, and I'll talk about that uh, in a bit. Now, I want to say a little bit about amyopathic and hypomyopathic JDM. I think, particularly in pediatrics, this is still an area that needs better understanding, uh, but really has been promoted particularly with adult dermatomyositis. And this is the concept of classic skin manifestations without the proximal muscle weakness or evidence of muscle disease. That's amyopathic. Hypomyopathic has been defined as if there's some subclinical myositis associated, for example, imaging or lab test. But, but not any evidence of weakness or um, muscle disease otherwise. Um, it's estimated overall to be in maybe 1% to 5% of patients. I know when we first started discussing this many years ago, it was, well, maybe they had it before, and now they're just continuing to have the skin manifestations. I think that's really hard to rule out. But at least following these patients over time, um, some of them do certainly progress and, and others don't. So inclusion criteria have recently been proposed for this. Uh, and one is the typical rash for at least six weeks. I've also seen some in other places six months. So I, I think that that number is up in the air. Um, they may have no more than mild calcinosis or nail bed capillary abnormalities, but certainly the heliotrope rash and the Gatron's papules or erythema. Two, no functional limitation or weakness by history or examination. And three, muscle enzymes less than or equal to 1.2 times the upper limit of normal. Exclusion criteria are systemic involvement, lung disease, dysphagia, aspiration, GI, vasculitis, or myocarditis, significant calcinosis, skin ulcers, lipodystrophy, 
or pregnancy. I'm not quite sure where that comes from. Okay. Uh, and then there was a recent study that I just, just to bring to your attention of 12 patients um, and comparing them to myopathic JDM. So amidst those uh, were, were patients with both amyo and hypomyo. And the younger and milder disease at onset, there were fewer systemic features in general. 75% of them had um, anti P155140, that's the TIF anti-TIF gamma-1, TIF-1 gamma, rather, and 17% without antibodies, and 8%, interestingly, had the MDA-5 antibodies. They were followed for a mean of about three years, and over that time, no functional disability, weakness, calcinosis, interstitial lung disease, lipodystrophy, uh, overall less myalgia and arthralgias or arthritis, despite receiving less therapy. 50% of them had received systemic steroid. Um, and in previous studies, 4% with calcinosis and an outcome better than in classical JDM. Now, overall, looking at the literature, about 26% eventually develop classic JDM, often years after onset. So these patients, even if they present with amyopathic or hypomyopathic, need to be followed regularly because that is a possibility that they will develop the muscle disease over time. And interestingly, in this, in this recent study, the rate of achievement of inactive disease was not higher than in classic JDM, with the disfiguring skin changes still persistent in 40%. So even though they may not have the other characteristics, these skin lesions are, are a major problem for patients. I'm just going to briefly mention that there are tools to specifically measure skin disease activity. Um, some of the ones that have been used most extensively are the disease activity score uh, for, for skin. These are separate scores for muscle and skin that are usually summed and given equal weighting to detect over time. It allows one to look specifically at what's happening with the skin. There is a cutaneous assessment tool that measures specifically skin activity versus skin damage within it, and then the modified uh, CDASI, the Cutaneous Dermatomyositis Disease Area and Severity Index, which was, has been promoted and looked at largely with adult dermatomyositis, but could be useful here as well, and specifically looking at the wide variety of disease areas, that's erythema scaling and ulcer, damage features, the poikiloderma and calcinosis, as well as the Gatron's lesions, the periungual change, and alopecia. Um, now, one of the problems is that current criteria for what's been called inactive disease largely focuses on muscle assessment and a physician global assessment. So skin disease plays a part of that, but it, it has not been a major part. And that's something that, that we need to keep in mind because therapy is directed towards inactive disease. I wanted to just say a little bit more about the non-invasive capillary microscopy um, and just to show you a little bit more about uh, predicted end, um, end row loops and disease of uh, the dis disease activity score over skin over 36 months. This is some old data that uh, Dr. Pachman did with one of our uh, fellows in pediatric dermatology many years ago. But, but it's, it's held true in, in terms of the fact that, that this is a wonderful way to be uh, looking at and predicting skin, but not quite as much muscle disease activity. Uh, and again, shorter duration of untreated disease um, really helps with, with uh, improving this feature. Um, I don't want to talk much about these uh, muscle-specific antibodies, uh, other than to say that this has been such an exciting development in the area of juvenile dermatomyositis because of the fact that we were always saying in the past, oh, you know, there aren't any, uh, and the kids don't have these autoantibodies when we were thinking about the ones that were just associated. But with these specific ones, uh, for the most part, we're talking about uh, a single one mapping per child, and that gives the opportunity then to really use these as biomarkers to try to help predict manifestations and outcome for patients. Uh, and these are two from the literature fairly recently. One is uh, Lisa's paper, uh, but, but just to, to show again that the majority of patients will have an autoantibody associated with, with lack of, of finding an autoantibody just in a fairly small number, maybe about um, 20 to 30 percent. 
And um, it's assumed that, that there is something there, it just hasn't been discovered yet. Uh, and for the most part, these map to either the uh, TIF-1 gamma or the NXP2 uh, with, with their various names. Um, and that has really helped as well as with some of the others that map to less common ones, whether that's MD5 or antisynthetase, uh, in, in uh, predicting not just systemic, but certainly also some of the cutaneous manifestations that will be seen. So I'm just going to mention those uh, in general as they relate to skin disease. So no autoantibodies, they tend to have milder disease in general. If we're talking about the anti-TIF1 gamma, um, these tend to be patients who've had more UV light exposure, greater chronicity, and more skin features. It's been linked to photosensitivity, to telangiectasia, inflammation, ulcers, edema, generalized lipodystrophy. Uh, the anti-NXP2, uh, less skin disease, especially less truncal skin disease, but more calcinosis. And then the uh, anti-MD5, uh, oral and skin ulcerations, but um, milder muscle disease. They may have amyopathic JDM, but of course this is, this is a big marker for interstitial lung disease. And then a very small group, the antisynthetase uh, in, in children, um, has been linked to this mechanics hand um, and lipoatrophy. The skin signs um, are, are really also helpful as a, as a predictor. So more persistent Catron's papules, Periungal nail fold capillary changes beyond three months after diagnosis are a predictor of a more chronic course, as is higher baseline disease activity. Of course, other predictors of that unrelated per se to, to skin are the longer duration, again, of untreated disease, the presence of subcutaneous swelling on MRI at diagnosis, extensive myopathic and vasculopathic changes in the first muscle biopsy, and then, uh, as mentioned, anti-TIF1. Uh, gamma autoantibodies. I want to just say a word about JDM versus adult dermatomyositis. I, I think that the clinical manifestations with respect to the skin are really quite equivalent. I've talked to our adult specialists as well and what's in the literature. And the manifestations of JDM very much are similar skin-wise to what we see with, with the adult. Uh, as mentioned, there's not that associated with malignancy. We do see more calcinosis in juvenile dermatomyositis, and the uh, MAA, the myositis-associated autoantibody, is more common in adults, although some of the myositis-specific antibodies are uh, more common in children than in adults. So finally, just with the little time left, I'm just gonna say a few words about management and uh, focus a little bit more on management of, of skin. Uh, so um, some of you, of course, manage much more than I do in terms of some of the systemic um, drugs that are used. So I'll just mention the use of largely pulsed IV steroid. We heard about this earlier, methotrexate for typical JDM uh, with the addition of IVIG of severe refractory and increasing use of biologics for recalcitrant disease, especially rituximab, others being looked at as well. Uh, cyclophosphamide, of course, has toxicities that we worry about, but is, is uh, as far as I can tell from the literature, still used a lot for the lung disease um, and ulcers, but I think the biologics are coming in more and more as certainly much safer alternatives. Um, I wish I had a slide that just had one thing on it for intervention for calcinosis because this is really a huge unmet need for patients. And 20 years ago we were saying early aggressive management is the key to prevent these and we're really still saying that at the very top because to date there's still no intervention that's been reprodu reproducibly effective. Uh, and promptly increasing immunosuppressive medication the calcinosis develops is, is, uh, can certainly be undertaken. The long list of medical therapies reflects the fact that there are anecdotal reports of help with this or that one, but there's no one agent that's been universally uh, successful. Uh, some uh, interesting studies about combinations, for example, of, of the sodium thiosulfate that's been used topically, or IV, uh, abatacept, with a, a 
large decrease in, in pain. We still surgically excise localized ones or try to uh, provide palliation of the larger debilitating wounds. And then, of course, we deal with wound care and management of infection when that occurs. But this is still a huge unmet need. And I want to just emphasize that because that's what makes some of the work that, that was just presented about uh, trying to understand more the underlying pathogenesis of this so much um, more exciting because by understanding the pathogenesis, we will hopefully have better therapy for this in the future. Uh, what about the telangiectasia? So for those patients who have done well, they've responded to therapy, but unfortunately still have this chronic telangiectatic process which persists, it can be extremely problematic for them because it's highly visible, of course. The face is a prominent area for the telangiectasia. And um, while there's not great therapy for this, one possibility to consider in highly motivated patients who want to go through this and, and um, it's, it's not inexpensive is, is laser therapy. So I'm just mentioning that, showing an example. It is a somewhat arduous multi-laser process, but has led to some good uh, results in, in uh, several patients that have been reported with a few different types of laser. Um, the, another manifestation that we often see of the skin with disease chronicity is, is itch and persistent skin dryness. Uh, and you can put on a lot of moisturizers and it really doesn't, uh, doesn't really help that much. Um, so we as dermatologists talk about avoidance of irritants, bathing followed by good moisturizers a few times daily. Uh, we've introduced topical steroids. I see a lot of, of dry, itchy scalp, for example, with chronicity, something not often talked about. And there are some steroid-containing oils that can be helpful for them. We've tried to introduce non-steroidal alternatives like calcineurin inhibitors, which can be helpful with the pruritus for some of these patients. But I should stress that it does not take away the skin lesions that are seen. Uh, of course, a variety of other uh, adjunctive managements like the calcium vitamin D because of the steroids and gastrointestinal protection as well and aerobic and resistance training exercises as well as, I can't stress enough, psychological intervention. We need to really have a high index of, of thinking about the large impact of this disease, not just the muscle and systemic, but the stigma and the psychological consequences of having um, th uh, a skin rash on the face that's persistent uh, and, and um, highly visible. And then I'm going to end by just mentioning a little bit about sun protection, uh, because sun protection, of course, is a cardinal feature of management for JDMS. Um, and we know, it was mentioned again earlier, that ultraviolet light not only triggers the skin disease, but also uh, exacerbates or can reactivate the myositis of JDM. Um, and there's been shown to be correlation with high UV index one month before onset, and higher UV index has been associated with the increase uh, in, in um, myositis-specific antibodies, uh, autoantibodies. Um, Oops, let me go back to that for a minute. And specifically with the uh, anti-P155-140, or also called uh, TIF1 gamma, but not with the uh, other common one, the uh, MJNXP2. So how do we protect kids from, uh, with juvenile dermatomyositis from the sun? Uh, and I'm just going to try to go through this simply. I'm happy to talk about this more afterwards. Uh, first is really education. I think a lot of families don't realize that there's still a lot of UV light out there when there are clouds in the sky. We talk about up to 80% of the UV still gets through on a cloudy day. Uh, if they're on a surface that is highly reflective, whether that's swimming, whether that's on sand, um, whether that's on a light-colored uh, play surface, uh, there can also be reflection. So just wearing that hat, for example, may not be enough. Uh, increased risk of altitude. Fluorescent lights, if they're not shielded, can be another source of UV. A window glass, of course, lets through not the UVB, but the UVA. And if you think you can go to a tanning bed, but you can't get exposed to the sun, that's not a good idea either, for, actually for anybody. Um, so we usually say peak 
UV is 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and seek shade during those times. Um, good cover up uh, with hats, sun protective clothing, and sunglasses. And uh, if you're not aware of it, one of the uh, nice things to tell patients about is the availability of laundry additives that can actually markedly increase the sun protection factor of clothes. So uh, there are a lot of somewhat expensive clothes out there in the market that, that are tighter weaves and have good sun protection, but there's also a product that the Rid Dye people put out that's called SunGuard that when uh, thrown into the wash with a big load of clothes gives you a sun protection factor of, of 36 that lasts through 20 washes. So um, often a good tip. Um, and then when we talk about sunscreens, we want broad spectrum. That means that it covers UVA as well with an SPF of at least 30 um, or above. Uh, if you start to go up in SPF, you have minimal additional impact. Doesn't hurt, but they often tend to be more expensive. And then there's the whole concept of the physical versus chemical blockers. Um, I think that the, the, there's a lot of data out there we're often largely recommending the physical blockers for children just because they sit on the surface of the skin and don't go into the outer layer um, and they work instantly. Whereas the chemical blockers, um, I, don't, I don't think they're dangerous at all, really. Um, although we still, still have a lot to learn, but the, the problem with them is that they have to get into the outer layer of stratum corneum and that can take 20 to 30 minutes of unprotected time if you think you're putting it on and then going out. So something to be aware of. Um, you can mix and match. I've sometimes had people put on the chemical containing and 20 minutes later put on over that the opaque, providing a little additional protection. And of course, we need to stress that we're not just talking about putting on a thin amount on the skin like we talk about with topical steroids. All of the studies that have been done to look at sun protection factor have involved putting on a good protective coat. So you really have to be able to see it when you put it on on these areas. Um, artificial tanners were asked about sometimes from, from the teenagers. And those are fine. Those are safe. But they don't provide sun protection. So you still have to be very careful in terms of protecting from the sun. Uh, there was just a uh, consensus-based management of, of skin predominant JDM that was put out by, by a, a group with CARA. Um, and just listing what these are up there, we, of course, optimal sun protection, um, use of topical therapies and recording them, and then um, if you have the skin predominant, everybody gets hydroxychloroquine, moving from there to the methotrexate on top, and then considering adding in uh, prednisone for those patients who are predominantly skin involved. So in summary, uh, it's, it's important to recognize the skin manifestations because they truly are key to diagnosis and early treatment. The amyopathic and hypomyopathic forms can occur, but close follow-up is needed. Uh, and remember that classic JDM may present with the skin features only. The course of the skin and the muscle disease can be different, and we can't just be targeting the muscle disease when we're uh, treating these patients. That muscle-specific autoantibodies occur in most patients with JDM and may predict the features in course. That all children need long-term daily photo protection and that there are some treatments available for the long-term sequelae, but none are uniformly efficacious and may be costly. And then I'll add to this summary that we desperately need a better understanding of what's going on in the skin of JDM, its relationship to the muscle disease, and how we can uh, treat with a better targeted approach. And I'll stop with that, and thank you for your attention. and classic looking go trends on all of her knuckles and elbows and knees. I treated her. She also complained of weakness and had some arthralgias. So I treated her as JDM, but when I went through steroids, her rash came right back. So we sent her to dermatology. She ended up biopsied and diagnosed with psoriasis. 
Um, and I was just wondering if there's any tips for the clinician <laughs> on how to differentiate psoriasis that looks in a Gotrans distribution. Okay, I, I do not think psoriasis, there, there's overlap because there are patients who can have both diseases, um, but the clinical signs of JDM really don't look like the clinical signs of psoriasis. Now, you know, we start to get into some of the mechanics hand and the scaling types, that's different. But true Gatron's papules over the knuckles, that's JDM. And I mean, that patient may have psoriasis. Psoriasis can be a fooler in young children. I'd be happy to look at your pictures, by the way. Uh, but, but I think that those are pretty distinct disorders. And by the way, we don't treat psoriasis with systemic steroids. Um, and sometimes that actually has, does bad things to psoriasis. So um, I think, I, I mean, I know we've had some patients with overlap, but I do think they are very distinct in terms of the clinical features on the hands. Now on the face, I think you can sometimes be fooled because psoriasis is often misdiagnosed and you can certainly see erythema on the eyelids and around on the face and it may not be distinct like we think of with plaques of psoriasis. So there I think there's a, there's a fooler, but. But one of the nice things about working with Amy, I call her, and we've had, um, first of all in JDM, we have had 23 other autoimmune diseases that occur in children with JDM. 8% of the total population of 600 kids. The top of the list is psoriasis, and we actually have a paper under review which shows that the RNA-seq pathway of JDM quiescent, no, they have no, huh, we think they have no disease. Well, now you know why I don't think that so much anymore. But then when they flare, with a rash that wasn't JDM, with psoriasis, the same genes came up. So it's a shared pathway. And what is, will that be true for the other autoimmune diseases? Why psoriasis and dermatomyositis? It's your job. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's interesting. I mean, psoriasis, there's a somewhat distinct signature, which is uh, largely a, a TH17 IL-23 signature, uh, but there's also a Th1 component to the signature of, of psoriasis. And, um, you know, in some individuals, there can be a little more of a shift towards that Th1 signature. So I think there certainly is some overlap. We also have to recognize that psoriasis is a common problem. Um, and uh, almost 1% of, of kids have it, and particularly as you go up in age, the, the chance of developing it, it is higher. Um, and so, uh, you know, how that has to do with this, what is the role of environmental factors, I think is very interesting too, uh, because psoriasis clearly can be driven by environmental factors, and there's an important role for toll-like receptor activation. Um, in, in the process of psoriasis, and I'll bet it is as well, uh, in, in dermatomyositis, just from looking at some of the environmental triggers. So, a lot more to learn. I just was wondering what clinical uh, skin disease activity scoring tool you use, and why? <laughs> well, actually, I tend to share my patients all with, with our, our rheumatologists who do clinical scoring. Um, we're actually starting to put some of these in, into EPIC, in our clinic kind of choose some of those because I'd like to start doing some of the scores that we're not routinely doing uh, in the rheumatology clinic. I'd like to try to get some experience with C. DASI, for example. Um, so that's, that's in transition right now. Uh, but I think it really is important to be having these scoring tools so there's uniformity in the collection of information and not just photographs and uh, descriptions. Uh, for those patients with really resistant skin disease, um, have you had the opportunity to try uh, combination anti-malarials, or are there any other tips or tricks that you have for the very resistant skin disease patients? Yeah, you know, I, I can't say that I do well with the very resistant ones. I, I don't know how much anti-malarials really do. I don't know that I've ever seen them change somebody with chronic disease, okay? Um, I, I think we use them commonly because for the one, on the one hand, they're about as safe as we can get in terms of something to intervene with. And 
uh, we, you know, this is a UV-driven disease, and uh, maybe it'll help to keep it from getting worse. But I can't say I've had somebody I put on an antimalarial, and it has turned around disease, especially when they have residual chronic disease. Um, when they have continued disease activity, uh, and, it's, and it's significant, I'm probably not going to just use the antimalarial. I might start with it for a short period, and then, as, as with the uh, consensus, I wouldn't keep them on too long with just that, because I really want to get in there with something that's going to be more anti-inflammatory than, than an antimalarial. That, that's how I feel about it. Um, a lot of the patients who come in with the disease chronicity, it's not inflammation. Um, it, I wouldn't say disease chronicity, let me rephrase that too. The residual, the residual dryness, itch, um, and telangiectasia. Um, I, and I don't think the anti-inflammatory therapies are going to do much other than maybe help with the symptoms. Uh, so I don't have any good answers on how to take away the damage. And I'll, that's a lot of what I see in these older patients who are doing well, but continue to come back with the damage. Hi, my name is Tracy Vaness. I'm on the uh, board of directors for CureJam. I have a 12-year-old son with juvenile dermatomyositis. I was just wondering if you could weigh in on your recommendation for the rash guard, specifically for the sun protective clothing that's tightly uh, woven. Um, is there sort of a, for lack of a better term, a life of that particular garment? Um, is it suggested like every year they should be replaced? Oh, wow, you know, that's a really I, good I question. I my local dermatologist here looking, looking with at this our one team too. of pediatric dermatologists. Um, we, you know, with the laundry additive, we know a certain number of washes, uh, but I, I always thought it was not a chemical treatment, but rather the tight weave, so it's probably gonna be a little less prone towards damage over time and your kid's more, probably more likely to outgrow it before you have a, a problem like that or something like that. But um, it's actually something that I don't know the answer to. You're the first person who's asked that question. Oh, no, that's, that's with the sun guard. Um, so, and they say 20, but we, we try to be conservative. But with when you buy these fairly expensive clothes that are tightly woven, that don't need the laundry additive, um, there's, there's a, you know, a long-term warranty and it's not real. They don't say uh, you can only use through certain numbers of washes or a certain number of years. <laughs> 